everyone, and thank you for attending this event sponsored by the Society of Professional Journalists, New England Chapter. My name is Haley Hersey, and I'm here tonight with Sally Quinn. Sally Quinn is a longtime Washington Post journalist, columnist, television commentator, Washington insider, and one of the Capitol's legendary hostesses. She's also the author of five books and the founder of the Washington Post religion website on faith. Quinn has been with the Washington Post for over 50 years, covering politics, culture, and social life. Sally, thank you for joining us. I'm so happy to be here. All right, so we're gonna get right into the questions. The Washington Post style, uh, style section made its debut on Monday, January 6th, 1969, replacing a section called For and About Women. A short time later, you joined the staff and began covering parties. What drew you to the Post? And had you considered a career in journalism before then? No, I wanted to be a movie star. <laughs> I went to Smith College. I majored in theater. Um, I got discovered by an MGM talent scout. I tried out for several parts on TV and in the movies. Um, and for various reasons, I did summer stock. It didn't work out. And so I had many, many different jobs. I moved back to Washington where my parents, I went to Europe with my parents. My father was in the military and I moved back to Washington. And uh, I had about 10 different jobs. I mean, really every possible kind of job you can imagine. And then I also did in New York too. I, mean, I worked for the Smithsonian Institution. I worked for Senator Barry Goldwater. I worked for Senator Eugene McCarthy who was very left-wing. I worked for Senator Bobby Kennedy. I worked for um, the, um, the, uh, an, an environmental group. I worked for a right-wing um, military analyst group. I worked for a left-wing, <laughs> you get the picture, <laughs> a left-wing uh, sort of think tank. Um, and, and then I had a, a job as a social secretary for the Algerian ambassador who was only 32 and a bachelor, gorgeous movie star. And he was living in uh, Lyndon Johnson's mansion that Johnson had had before he became president. And um, so I got to run all his parties because he didn't have a wife. And that was really fun because my parents had always entertained a lot when I was growing up. And so I really knew how to do that. Um, and then that was over and I, you know, was floundering around for jobs. And so I decided to go back to theater. So I went to um, try out for a play that was being performed at Washington's uh, local theaters here. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a Joseph Heller play called We Bombed in New Haven. And meanwhile, I had been interviewed as a, for a job as the uh, secretary for the editorial page editor who had hired me on Monday and fired me on Tuesday because he said I was overqualified. And besides, I didn't know how to type or file. <laughs> so, so uh, it, but he had sort of kept me in mind. So when Ben Bradley, who later became my husband, who was editor of the Post, was looking for a party reporter, I had met the editor of the editorial page many times socially. He suggested to Ben that he'd call me. And so I went to interview Ben and also went to try out for this play. And um, you talk about Robert Frost, The Road Not Taken. The same day I got a call from the director of the play saying that I had the lead. And I also got a call from Ben saying, you know, you don't know me, but I'm the editor of the Washington Post and I'm interested in hiring you to cover parties. And so I went down to see Ben and that was the end of my acting career because I was so dazzled by him. I mean, I was too young to fall in love with him because he was 20 years older and he was Mr. Bradley, you know. Um, but he was just so incredible. I couldn't think of anything I'd rather do than work for this man. So the next day I went out and I covered my first party and I had my first byline. Amazing. So Kind of to go back a little bit to For and About Women, uh, what was it like starting on the ground floor of a brand new section? Uh, did it make you feel like you were breaking new ground in journalism or did you have any doubts about if it would be a success or not? 
Well, you know, everybody was against getting rid of foreign about women because every paper had a women's section and they covered teas and, you know, little white glove luncheons, ladies luncheons and, you know, very sort of formal embassy receptions. And it was all done very properly. And um, everybody, all the ladies in the style section wore hats <laughs> to cover all of these events. And Ben just, Ben invented the style section and he just totally just threw everything up in the air and let it land. And one of the things he did was he hired people from other sections of the paper who were good writers because he wanted to be a writer's section and not just about women. I mean, he wanted to cover music and and it was in the sixties, you know, and he wanted to cover hate Ashbury and the, you know, left wing movements and the, anti-Vietnam protests and all of that kind of thing. And um, so my desk was next to this guy named Phil Casey, who was in his 60s and was an old police reporter who had been on a police beat forever. Brilliant writer. I mean, he did the best police stories and he smoked like a fiend. He had a pile of cigarettes in his ashtray, a very gruff voice. And so I sat down next to him. I had my little white gloves when I, which I did when I went to interview Ben. And I said, hello, Mr. Casey. <laughs> and he looked at me and he said, so you're going to cover parties, are you? And I said, yes, sir. And he said, well, I got one piece of advice for you, kid. And I said, what's that? And he said, just remember, no matter what you're covering, but especially parties, uh, there is always a victim and there's always a perp. <laughs> so I think that's the best advice I ever had in my life. Because uh, I sort of looked at parties differently then. It wasn't just, oh, Mrs. Jones, you know, had this beautiful dinner party and she looked divine and peach lace and the curtains were beautiful and the table was set. And these were the fabulous people who came. And, because that's not really what party reporting was about. What it was about was, who was there and what were they talking about, which in Washington is always something interesting, usually about politics. And so that's how I started covering politics is because I, I didn't know how to write. I mean, Ben had said when he hired me, he said, can you show me something you've written? And I said, well, I've never written anything. And he said, well, nobody's perfect, you know, just go out. And, and I had a boyfriend who was a journalist and I called him that night when I got back from my first party, I was sitting down to write and I said, I don't know what to do. I, I, I don't know how to write a newspaper story because most newspaper stories, you start out with who, where, why, what, and when, you know, the five W's. And uh, he said, look, yeah, I had a good friend who was one of the great gossips in town and also a great party girl. <clears throat> and he said, just pretend like you got back from the party and you're talking to Barbara and she says, how was the party? So that's how you start. Um, and so I think the lead of the story was, well, you wouldn't believe. <laughs> I, I, you know, I didn't know how to start. Last night at the such and such, there was a blah, blah, blah. And here is, you know, I, I didn't know how to do that. Um, so anyway, I did that. And the story came out fine and ran in the paper the next day. Uh, and from then on, I just, it just, I took to it. It was really fun. Dorothy McArdle, who had been a crime reporter in Philadelphia, was married to a guy in the State Department, and she had also worked in the State Department and covered the State Department. And she now was in foreign about women, and she covered parties, mostly embassy parties. And Dorothy um, took me out my first party. And it should like Phil Casey, Dorothy was in her 60s, late 60s. And we got to the party and she had a little white haired short lady, perfectly, you know, with pearls, black and pearls. And she, we got to the party and she said, now, I just have one piece of advice. And I said, that, what's that? And she said, always get a drink first. <laughs> so we headed to the bar and we got both had Dubonnet on the rocks and she knocked it back and I knocked it back. And she said, okay, now we can go to work. And that also served me well. <laughs> Lovely. Um, so Ben Bradley, as we've already talked a little bit about, said in his memoir, A Good Life, um, that you had soon 
had patented the sassy, irrelevant, insightful profile where the interviewee provides the ammunition and the interviewer pulls the trigger. What were some of these parties in Washington like then? And how did you approach your subjects? And how did you choose what parties to cover? Well, um, I think he was probably talking a lot. I mean, he's probably talking about the parties, but also the interviews as well, because I was doing a lot of personal interviews with people. But <clears throat> one of the things, I mean, I grew up, you know, I, I spent a lot of time in Washington and I'd worked for various, I worked at the Pentagon, you know, I worked at the Diplomatic Corps, worked on the Hill. Um, and so I knew what the conversations in the parties were like, at the parties were like. And uh, I knew that they weren't just about the weather. So what I started doing was before I would go out to a party, I would go into the national desk and I would go around to the reporters and I'd say, what's the big story today? And if you could find out what was going on behind the scenes, what would you like to know? And I would go to the foreign desk. And if it was, a, I might go to the sports desk, you know, I mean, it just, or the business desk, but mostly I spent most of my time, or the Metro desk. And I would just sort of find out what they wanted to know, what was going on. Um, and, I, you know, I, would, I read the paper um, thoroughly. So I knew everything was happening. Um, and and it, particularly, we often would have guest lists if there were, if it was a, uh, if it was a reception or something like that. Um, so I would, tell them who was coming to the party. And if it was Henry Kissinger, they'd say, oh my God, you know, here's what I want you to ask him. Well, the thing was that I found also having a drink first loosened me up, but that other people at parties were much looser than they would be if you were sitting in their office behind a desk taking notes and they had a secretary sitting, and, you know. And so they would be standing there with a drink and they're sort of jollying it up and it's after hours and they're ready to relax and have a nice time. And I always had my notebook with me. I mean, I, they all knew who I was. I would go up and say, I'm Sally Quinn from the Washington Post. <clears throat> um, and then I would just sort of say, ask them questions. And oftentimes I would scoop the national desk or. <laughs> Or the, or the foreign desk, because I'd come back with stories and sometimes the, they would even take them away from me. You know, they'd say, oh my God, this is a big story. We can't just run this in style in a party story. But um, so I got people to talk to me that way uh, and, and never pretending that I was anything but reporting, but always, you know, I was always dressed in party attire. I was always dressed in cocktail clothes. So I looked like and I always had a glass of wine in my hand or something. So I looked like there I was at a party, which I was. And uh, I just found that people were much more forthcoming and often said things that they didn't really want to say or mean to say, but they were more relaxed and more comfortable in that setting. Also in A Good Life, uh, Bradley listed some of what he felt were some of your most memorable profiles, including stripper Sally Rand, who you described as a tough old broad, um, the Washington Affair, in which you said there is something for everyone, and ballet star Rudolf Nureyev, who you wrote, quote, has those high Tatar cheekbones, the slightly slanting eyes, the full cruel mouth slashed by an old scar, the taut muscular body, strong but gentle hands, tussled brown hair, and a provocative half mischievous, half soulful look in his eyes. And of course, there has there is his behind. He has a fabulous behind. <laughs> what are some of your favorite profiles that you've done? <laughs> well, that was one of them. Um, uh, some of the ones that I had fun doing were, um, I, I interviewed um, Cornelia Wallace's mother, Big Ruby. And Cornelia Wallace was married to George Wallace, who was the right wing segregationist governor of Alabama. And, um, her mother was named Big Ruby, and she was a real character. And um, George Wallace, Cornelia was beautiful and tall, and his wife, and George was really short, um, but very dynamic. And um, so I interviewed Big Ruby, and at one point I asked her how she liked George. 
And she said, well, shoot, honey, he ain't even but titty high. You know? <laughs> it was that kind of thing that, that made these interviews fun. Um, there was a guy named Steve Martindale who had come to Washington from um, Idaho, Pocatello, Idaho. <clears throat> and he had sort of insinuated himself into the Washington social scene in this brilliant way. I mean, he showed up at every party and he was in, I mean, literally invited everywhere and he started entertaining. And suddenly we were covering his parties. This guy was about 30 or 32 years old. We were covering his parties and he'd have Henry Kissinger and Alice Roosevelt Longworth, who were the two of the hottest names in Washington showing it. So I decided to do a profile of Steve, like how did he do this? Um, and it was fascinating because he was perfectly forthcoming about it. When he, he said, well, if I want to get both of them, I'll call Alice Longworth and tell her that Henry Kissinger is coming. Then I'll call Henry Kissinger and tell him that Alice Roosevelt Longworth, this is President Roosevelt's daughter. And then they both show up. And then as soon as people know that that's who's going to be at the party, everybody comes. Um, he was devastated by the piece. And a lot of people made fun of him afterward. But, but the fact was that it was a really interesting look at how social Washington works. And I like Steve, you know, I think he was a decent guy. Um, but this is how he operated. And um, Alice, I did an Alice interview with Alice Roosevelt Longworth on her 90th birthday, she promised me an interview. And so I went to her house, and I spent hours with her. And, um, and she, and she it was supposed because she was a Republican, she was supposedly tight with Nixon, but she was very critical of Nixon and men and sex and, you know, men with those things dangling between their legs, you know. <laughs> yeah. uh, and it was just, it was a real profile of, of who she really was, um, which was quite wicked actually. So, I mean, there were a few, those were a few. I mean, there are lots that I enjoyed doing. I mean, I love doing Sally Rand because Sally Rand was a stripper and she was still stripping in her 80s and she was fabulous. I loved her. Um, you know, there she was, you know, she'd have low lights and lots of makeup and dyed hair and, but she had these two feather fans that she'd cover her lower parts and her upper parts with and she'd do the fan dance and she was amazing. A slight change of uh, pace here. Um... Of course, as you were becoming a fixture in the style section, something else was happening at that time. We've kind of briefly talked a little bit about it. Um, ben Bradley started getting anonymous letters that he said were both flirtatious and cryptic. Can you tell us about how your relationship developed and about the lunch where you admitted the letters were from you? Well, I, you know, we had, I had been, as I said, completely dazzled by him. <clears throat> I was living with somebody in New York at the time, we'd been together for about seven years, but we didn't, you know, we just didn't see each other that often because he was in New York and he's a journalist and I was in Washington. And I was, you know, more and more just attracted to Ben. And then um, the summer before we got together was the a Republican convention in um, Miami. And so I was covering it for the style section and Ben was obviously going down to lead the bureau. And um, the Washington Post uh, travel section had put us next to each other in seats. Everybody all flew economy, everybody in the paper. So there I was seated next to Mr. Bradley. Um, and it was a two and a half hour flight and it was the most turbulent flight you could ever imagine in your life. And I'm a hysterical flyer, you know. I'm the person in the back row who screams, oh my God, we're all gonna die, you know. And, um, but we started talking and the conversation, we just sort of fell on each other and the conversation just got more and more intimate and more personal. And meanwhile, the plane was going up and down and up and I kept grabbing his thigh, you know, and he was holding on to me because I was so frantic. Um, and so by the time we got to Miami, Oh, I was just a wreck. And so he said he was having dinner that night with David Brinkley and his wife, Susan, who were friends of mine. And in fact, I had dated David Brinkley, who had been the NBC anchor. And um, 
asked me if I'd like to join them, just the three of them. And I said, I'd love to. And he said, well, uh, I'll, I'll call you at your hotel and tell you what time and where. So I went to my hotel. I was just quivering with excitement. And he called and he said, I've got bad news. He said, my roommate, the managing editor, Howard Simons, has uh, already arranged for us to have dinner with take a group of reporters out for dinner at Joe's Stone Crab. <clears throat> and I'm afraid I can't get out of it. So I'm going to have to cancel the Brinkley's, but why don't you join us at Joe's Stone Crab? So I said, fine. Well, I got there and, you know, there were tw at least 12 reporters and I was at one end and Ben was at the other. And I sort of looked longingly at him and he looked at me and, you know, but then we left. And then um, the next day I was at the convention hall and I finished run my reporting. I came out about 830 at night and I was standing on the corner hailing a cab and I heard this loud voice say taxi. And I looked around. It was Ben. And he said, oh, would you like to share a cab? And I said, sure. And he said, um, well, I'm going to join some friends at the Fountain Blow Hotel for a drink. Would you like to join me? So I said, yes. And we get to the hotel and there we get out and there's the editor of the editorial page, Phil Jela and about five friends. And I was, Benji, Sal, oh, come on. We're all going to have a drink together and everything. And it was funny because it was clear that we both wanted to be alone with each other. And so we both kind of said, oh, I think we'll turn in. So he went back to his hotel and I went back to mine. And um, it was that kind of thing the whole week. And finally I got back and I realized that I was just, I had fallen in love with him on the plane. Um, but I mean, he was married. He had God knows how many children and you know, it was not possible. And so, but I started sending these little messages to him, anonymous notes, which every time we'd have an encounter in the newsroom, I would send a note kind of referring to the encounter, but very cryptic. Um, so it wasn't so obvious. So like, if he really didn't want to respond, he could pretend that he didn't know who they were from. And I'd send one about every three or four weeks. And it turned out he had no idea it was me. And finally, in about March, I said to my best friend, Paul Richard, who was the art critic, I said, Paul, I'm madly in love with Ben Bradley and I wanna be with him. And by the way, this is right in the middle of Watergate. And um, I'm going to tell him that I'm in love with him. And he said, you cannot do that. And I said, why? He said, because everything rests on what happens in Watergate. And right now the Washington Post is out there alone. Nobody else is covering Watergate. Ben is, you know, the paper's reputation is on the line. Ben's reputation is on the line. The paper's survival is on the line. The country is on the line, you know? Well, he, he said, you've got to put your country first. <laughs> it sounds a little dramatic, but since I was an army brat and I was grown up to be patriotic and, you know, the flag and country and all that, that was probably the one thing that he could say to me that would really stop me from doing anything. So I just bit my tongue and did nothing. And finally, in May, I guess, CBS News came to me and asked me to do um, to be the first network anchor woman in America to do the CBS Morning News. And my boyfriend was in New York and we were still seeing each other on the weekends. And so I said, yes, um, and I went up there. I. I went to Ben, I cried, I said, I didn't want to do it. He said, you can't leave, you know, I'm not going to let you leave. And, you know, it was just very emotional. And, but I had to get, I, I just had to get away because I thought this is untenable and I just can't live this way. So I took the job, moved up to New York and then came back and I asked him to take me to lunch for a farewell lunch. And I practiced for hours, for days on my little speech, what I was going to say to him. And so we got to lunch and we each ordered chicken salad. I mean, it was a mound of chicken salad like that. I was so nauseated. I couldn't even think of eating a bite. And I said, Mr. Bradley, I just want to tell you that I'm leaving the Washington Post because I'm madly in love with you and I can't stay this, stay here anymore. <laughs> and I just blurted it out. And he just looked at me just shocked. And he said, oh my God, I can't believe you're saying this because I'm in love with you too. So 
we agreed to meet that night at my apartment. And of course, we're right in the middle of Watergate. And we were going to meet, he was going to meet me at seven o'clock. And he um, comes up to me in the newsroom about five and he says, listen, Woodward and Bernstein are working on a really big story. I not, may not make it until at seven. How about 7.30? And I said, well, how about never? <laughs> I can't believe I said that, but I did. And he said, I'll be there at seven. <laughs> and he showed up and that was the beginning of our relationship. And um, it was very fast. I mean, we declared our love immediately. And But I was starting CBS Morning News. And so I had to go on the air and I had to go publicize the show and I had to go on a tour, book, you know, promoting the show. And... Um, so we were calling each other in those days, you know, I'd have to find a phone booth. <laughs> there was no such thing as a cell phone. So I was calling phone booths and um, then we met several times out. I was doing a show in Cincinnati and so he flew up there and we drove around the highway and found this great motel. I mean, it was, it was that kind of thing. And then finally, and we started the show, which was a complete disaster. I didn't want to be there. I didn't want to do it. I hated every minute of it. I had to get up at two in the morning to write the show, which started at 7 a.m. And I am not a morning person. And um, and then we finally came out of the closet. Um, we were trying to sneak around, but one day Ben flew up to have lunch with me and um, New York and it was in the fall it was like end of September and um, we went to Tavern on the Green and the, this beautiful terrace outside and the leaves it was quite chilly but the leaves were beautiful it was a gorgeous day and so we were sitting out there and the only other people out on the terrace were these two little old ladies off in the corner of the terrace and so we were sort of holding hands and making out and you know just and then I went back and you know, got in bed to, so I could get up early and he flew back to Washington. He walked in the newsroom, walked in his office and one of his editors, the national editor walked in and slammed the door and he said, Bradley, you and Quinn, huh? And Ben said, what, what are you talking about? What are you talking about? And he said, my mother was having lunch at Tavern on the Green. <laughs> and she saw you and Sally together. And Ben said, oh, no, my God. <laughs> so we had to tell people. So we we did. And of course, within a couple of phone calls, um, uh, it, the word was out and it got in the papers. And so that's how we got together. And then I finally quit the show, which I hated in the beginning of December and came back to Washington. And um, they wanted me to work in the bureau and that didn't work out. And then the New York Times hired me, but I didn't want to go to the Times. And so Ben finally convinced that managing editor to hire me as if he had nothing to do with me. So Ben recused himself from anything that I ever did or wrote in the paper, which he actually stuck to his word. And I went back to work for the Post. That's quite a wonderful story. Um, it actually prompted a question in the chat asking, could your relationship with Bradley happen today between a reporter and a managing editor? Well, you know, I often wonder about that because so many of us who are together met in the newsroom. I mean, Bob Woodward, I introduced Bob Woodward's wife, Elsa, to him. And he hired her to be a reporter on Metro when Bob was the editor of Metro and they fell madly in love and ended up living together. And, you know, the thing that is unrealistic is to expect that you're not going to find somebody in the workplace who you're compatible with because you're thrown with these people every day. You know, there are a lot of attractive young people in the newsroom, interesting, exciting people. Um, and so I just, I don't think it's realistic. I mean, Mary Jordan and Kevin Sullivan, who are married now, met at the paper. She wasn't working for him, but they were colleagues working on the same stories. Um, Susan Glasser and Peter Baker both started the Washington Post and Susan was Peter's editor and they ended up together. Um, and these are great marriages and great relationships. So um, I, I think, it's a very tricky thing because if you are 
if you're in a relationship, I mean, if you're in a job and you start being attracted to somebody in your office or your newsroom or whatever, um, you're not going to just say, oh, I'm never going to see that person again because we work together. But I think at some point, if you do start seeing each other, certain, if one, one works for the other, I think then that you have to go to management and say, you know, we're involved in it. But that's, that's also hard to do in a timing because when you first start seeing each other, you don't know whether it's going to end up being anything or not. And clearly, if one person works the other, one of them is going to have to change jobs. And often, not as much anymore, but often it's the man who's the boss. And so often it's the woman who has to change jobs. But I don't know. I mean, I think the idea of saying no workplace relationships is just, it just doesn't make any sense because it's not realistic. It's going to happen. So I think that work places should try to, organizations should try to figure out a way to handle it so that when the inevitable comes, and it does all the time, um, I mean, when I was in the Washington Post, there were lots of people who were having affairs with each other. Um, and, um, and I'm sure that's true in any work environment. And, you know, especially if you've got a situation like COVID or something where it's really hard to meet people. And look how many people are on dating apps because they just don't have any place to meet people. And and the one place you have to meet people is in your your office or your workplace. Thank you for answering that question. Um, I want to go back to a little bit about CBS Morning News when you started there. Um, your time there may have been short, but what was it like to again break ground as the first female network anchor in the United States? It was horrible. <laughs> it was really horrible. Well, for one thing, I had no training. I didn't have any practice uh, and I'd never been on TV in my life. So there I was suddenly in the studio and there was this camera and I didn't even know that it meant, you know, when the red light was on that I was on the air. I, I mean, I didn't know anything. I didn't know how to read a teleprompter. This is the first day. And of course I got pneumonia the first day. So I was sick as a dog. And for some reason I decided I had long blonde hair and I decided that I had to look dowdy because I wanted to look serious. So I sort of, put my hair in this sort of old lady hairdo. Doesn't look so hot right now, but anyway. <laughs> and I had granny glasses and I had this sort of little yellow, um, like a military jacket. It was hideous. I don't know what I was thinking. And I was so sick that I could almost not stand up. And um, that was my debut on television. And it went downhill from there. My co-anchor was a fabulous guy named Hughes Rudd, who was a, a a Texas journalist who had been a newspaper reporter before he came to work for CBS. And he was totally iconoclastic and really funny. And, <clears throat> and the reason they hired me was because the women at CBS went on basically on strike and said, you know, you, there's not a single woman anchor in the country. And we think it's time that a woman be an anchor. And so what do they do? They go out and they hire me instead of hiring one of them, which is what they should have done. Um, and they hired me because they liked the way I write and they wanted something snappy and saucy and, you know, uh, sort of outrageous. I don't know what they thought they wanted, but, and they interviewed and Hughes got to choose who he wanted for his co-anchor and they interviewed all of these women and Hughes didn't want any of them. And so Gordon Manning, who was the head of CBS News and who was an old friend of Ben's called me up and asked me to come up for an interview. And so the three of us had lunch with Hughes no, Hughes and Gordon and I had lunch and Hughes and I just hit it off. I mean, we were like thieves, you know, thick as thieves. And at the end of the lunch, Gordon said, I want Sally. <laughs> and Gordon said, okay, Hughes, why Sally over all the others? And he said, cause she's meaner than a junkyard dog. <laughs> so that was my <laughs> claim to fame. But we got on the air. And then, of course, I, I have to say that if, if, it were, um, if, I, if, if it were 11.30 p.m. show, like a nighttime talk show today, it would have been a smash hit. 
because Hughes and I were really outrageous. And, and everything that came out of my mouth was just stupefying. Funny, but stupefying. And they couldn't deal with it because it was the news. Nobody had ever talked that way on the news. And um, so it was just, I was about 50 years too late, 45 years too late. I mean, too early. Um, anyway, I just made one gaffe after the other. I mean, I they weren't gaffes, but just things that I sh probably shouldn't have said on the air. And, um, and so then um, Don Hewitt, who was the producer of 60 Minutes, decided he wanted me on 60 Minutes. And I was supposed to cover Princess Anne's wedding. And so I went over, he was going to be my producer. And he took me shopping. He had a total makeover, new mag makeup, hair, bought all these new clothes for me. And then we went over there <clears throat> and he made a pass at me. <clears throat> and that's when I decided to quit. At that time, Ben and I were together. And um, so I called Ben and he said, I'm getting on a plane right now. I'm going to come over and kill the son of a bitch. And I said, no, 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 just please leave it the way it is. I will come. I will come back. And this is it. So I quit. And that's when I went back to the paper. But it was just, I mean, it was horrible. I had to get up at two in the morning to supposedly write the show because I was a quote writer on a, as opposed to the other women on TV. Well, of course you don't write the show. You do maybe a one minute intro to a, to a film piece. That's not writing the show. You don't have to be a writer to do that. And so we'd stagger in, you know, the car would pick me up at one o'clock and I'd stagger in and try to do these intros to film pieces, which was not the most creative thing I'd ever done. Bleary eyed, <clears throat> and then four o'clock in the morning, we'd have lunch, which was Chinese carry out food. And you can imagine at four o'clock in the morning, how disgusting that would be. And then, you know, the show would go on at seven. I, you know, I would get made up and I'd pass out while they were making me up. I'd fall asleep and then I'd have to get together and, and go on the show and be bright eyed and bushy tailed. And then after the show, you know, we'd prepare for the next day's show. And then at noon, Hughes and I would go out for a Mexican lunch and we'd get completely smashed. We're drinking margaritas. And then we'd go home and pass out because that was the only way I could go to sleep. So we'd pass out about five o'clock so I could wake up at one o'clock in the morning. This is no way to live. And I, I remember when Diane Sawyer took over ABC. Diane Sawyer had the show after I did. She was one of many who followed me, but um, then when she went to ABC, Good Morning America, and she was going to do it for three months, and <clears throat> her husband, Mike Nichols, I ran into him at a lunch, a sort of a brunch thing, and I said, so how's it going with Diane doing the morning news? And he said, this is not life as we know it. <laughs> And he was right. I mean, it's just, it's no way to live. And so I couldn't wait to get out of there. And Ben couldn't wait to have me back. And, and so <clears throat> we ended up happily ever after. I'm sorry, I've got a scratchy throat. I think I swallowed my water wrong. No worries at all. Um, speaking a little bit more about Ben, his reputation as an editor is of course legendary, um, but can you tell us a little bit more of what he was like as a person? Well, of course, I was madly in love with him, <laughs> so I'm prejudiced. He was unbelievably sexy. I mean, just to die for sexy and really good looking. And he was very masculine. He was very um, craggy and sort of, you know, chiseled jaw and he had a great build, muscular body. And he, he was an athlete and um, he had a swagger, you know. When Tom Hanks was doing The Post, playing Ben in the movie The Post, I gave him swagger lessons. Because <laughs> Ben just sort of kind of walked like this, you know. And, um, but he, uh, he was the most charming person I've ever met. He was really smart. He denied being an intellectual. He wasn't really an intellectual. He was just really, really smart. But he, he didn't have a phony bone in his body and he could not 
he could not deal with bullshit. You know, he just had a bullshit detector that was up to here. And um, so he was probably the most authentic person I've ever known and charming and everybody loved him. I mean, he was kind and he was funny and he was, you know, he had a great sense of humor. He, he was a man's man, but of course women were all over him all the time. I mean, I, I just said to him, listen, <clears throat> My philosophy is, I'm like with Ronald Reagan when he was dealing with the Russians, which is trust but verify. So I said, if you want to hide something from me, you better really hide it because I'm going to be checking your collar for lipstick. <laughs> and you'll be in big trouble. <laughs> um, but I mean, he did have a lot of women after him, but um, he was he was uh, unbelievably romantic and he was. He was a, a one woman, a one gal guy. You know, he really loved me and I really loved him. And we had a fabulous marriage. I mean, we were in love with each other until the day he died. I think I was more in love with him the day he died than I had been when we first got together. And he with me. And even the last two years when he really had serious dementia, in some really odd way, may have been the best two years of our marriage because we were never separated for a second and I took care of them the whole time. I didn't have a nurse and, um, and I loved taking care of them and he loved me taking care of them. That's beautiful. Thank you for sharing that with us. Um, in 2017, you published your book, Finding Magic, A Spiritual Memoir, in which you describe your life as a spiritual quest. You talk about everything from learning voodoo from the household staff as a child to caring for a learning disabled son and keeping vigil during Ben's illness and death as we just kind of talked about. How did these experiences impact you spiritually and what made you decide to explore them in this book? Well, I had gotten, I'd always been interested in religion and you know, because my father was in the military, we traveled all over the world. So I was exposed to a lot of different religions and um, it fascinated me, and I was an atheist from the time I even, before I even knew what the word meant. I didn't believe in God. Uh, it just didn't make any sense to me. Um, and I'd have to say my prayers at night, but I didn't really believe it. And when I finally was about 13, I told my father that I didn't believe in God, and he went crazy. Um, and I wouldn't go to church. They made me go to Sunday school, and I, I started refusing. So he tried to bribe me to go to church. He went to Paris and brought back the most beautiful pair of black suede, kitten heeled, pointed toes, shoes you've ever seen in your life and sort of dangled them to me and said, if you want these, you have to go to church. And I said, okay, I'll go to church. <laughs> and I went to church and I wore my high heels all the way down to the front and sat in the front row so everybody would see me with my high heel shoes on. <laughs> so. But, um, you know, I, I just never was interested. And in, I mean, I was always interested, but I never a believer. But as a journalist, I realized this is 15 years ago, I realized particularly with the Middle Eastern wars and the issues between the Sunnis and the Shiites and the evangelical Christians in this country and the, you know, the, the Muslim problems in, in, in the Far East, um, I, I realized that it was a huge story that we weren't covering. And I wrote many memos, the editor who wasn't interested, this is after Ben left. And finally, I went to Don Graham, who was the publisher of the paper. And I said, we are not covering the story and it is a huge story and it should be every aspect of it. And he said, well, why don't you start a religion website? At that point, the WashingtonPost.com had just been started and it was in a building in Arlington, Virginia, which is across the bridge, which might as well be in another country on another planet. I mean, they wore jeans over there and they had concrete floors and they had free bagels and coffee. That's how wild it was. Oh, and they had a ping pong table. Uh, these are all the tech people. And so I said, okay, I've never, I don't know anything about religion. I don't know anything about the internet. And he said, well, nobody's perfect. He was. Um, mimicking Ben. So I went over there and it was great because I could do anything I wanted. I mean, nobody knew what, you know, it was, everybody was starting up everything. So I started this thing and it became an instant success. 
and and I was interviewing everybody, you know, atheists, agnostics, Buddhist, Jews, is Muslims, Christians, you name it. Um, and it was fascinating. I just learned so much and I had the best time. And then we started, we had a page in the newspaper that was called, I called it on, I named it On Faith. I got John Meacham, who is a religion scholar and historian, was editor of Newsweek. And I had no street cred when it came to religion, but John did. And so I called him and asked him if he would be my co-moderator, which he said, yes, but he said, I have a day job, so you're going to have to run the show. And I said, okay, fine. But this way I could send out invitations to people and say, John Meacham and I <laughs> are doing this website and we'd like to interview you. And so it just really took off. And um, so I did that for seven years and I had a fabulous time and it, I learned more. And John had argued with me about being an atheist because John is a practicing Episcopalian and a believer. And he said, I wasn't an atheist because he said, if you're an atheist, it means you believe in nothing and you're, it, it's a negative thing and you're not a negative person. You're just against religion. And I wasn't against religion. I just didn't believe in it. And so anyway, he, he said, you know, here's a list of books you need to read. And so I read all these books by all of these sort of intellectuals and philosophers and uh, theologians. And I just got more and more interested in the subject. And in fact, I'm writing a novel right now, which is, has a lot to do with religion. Um, and, uh, and so I, I kept doing it until the post was running out of money. And they, what the first thing to go is religion. So they had to, they started cutting my staff. I had eight people and, and I had a columnist and I had editors and, you know, and so finally I had nothing but a half, a half an editor and they just said, we can't keep it going. And, um, and that was before Jeff Bezos bought the Washington Post. So we partnered with a group in New York and took the website away um, and shared it with them. And, and they went, uh, didn't work. Uh, they, it, it just didn't work out. They didn't, they couldn't handle it uh, and they couldn't afford it. And one of the things I realized too was that it was so much easier for me to get people to write for the Washington Post than it was for this unknown website in New York, you know, because I, I got every famous person in the world, including the Dalai Lama to write for me and Archbishop Tutu and, you know, you name it. And so that wasn't fun. And I, you know, by that time, Ben was really sick and I just didn't want to, I didn't want to do it. I didn't have time because I was with him every minute. So I sort of gave it up. I, I did a little consulting with them and then they sold it to somebody else and it's in the ether somewhere right now. But I continue to be fascinated by religion and I, I do interviews with religious people and, and um, I think about it a lot and I talk to them and I write pieces about it and, uh, and then I'm writing a novel about it. Wonderful. I am seeing in the chat that we have a few more questions. So um, at this time, we'll open it up to some of those. First we have, how did you learn to write like a journalist? Let, let me just say one more thing about the, the, the spiritual side, because my book was very spiritual. Uh, and it was about discovering my own spirituality and about learning how to be, um, how to be totally comfortable with myself and how to accept myself. And um, I, I just, I, I learned, as I said, I learned so much about it, but one of the things is that I, I wanted to work on becoming the person that I wanted to be. And um, I'm almost there, <laughs> not quite, but just obviously trying to be a better person, but um, just uh, at thinking more about other people than about myself and uh, about my ambitions and my goals and my this. Of course, I have goals and ambitions, but I just find that I'm much happier when I'm, you know, taking care of somebody, taking care of Ben or helping. I have a son with learning disabilities, um, taking care of my friends. Um, my, at this stage of my life, a lot of my friends are sick and dying. And so I find that I'm ministering to a lot of people in an odd way. 
a follow-up to that then I suppose would be um do you find that writing this book this novel that you're working on do you find that this is a sort of therapeutic outlet for you to kind of explore this spirit uh, spirituality a little bit further well certainly the finding magic I did um that was a really important and and that was after Ben died that I started writing it <clears throat> and I mean, it was very cathartic. I mean, I, I would sit at my desk and just sob for hours and hours and hours. Um, but I, it, you know, it was, a, it was a real voyage of discovery for me, of really learning who I was and also seeing things that I had done wrong and wish I had done better. I, I'm not, I don't have a lot of regrets. I'm not a, uh, I'm not, I don't look back, um, but there were, things I wish I had known more about. And I spent, I allowed myself to grieve for Ben for a long time. It, it'll it be eight years on October this, October the 21st, that he will have been day, at eight years. And um, I still dream about him every night. I still miss him every day. I still love him. Um, but that, that, the missing him and the pain of that has really helped me understand other people and other people's pain and a lot more than I ever did before. I mean, certainly I learned that with my son, Quinn, who was born with a heart defect and was in the hospital in and out until he was 16 and still has, he's fabulous now. I mean, he's 40 years old. He has two books. He's on finishing his third. He has his own website. He's, you know, he's married to a beautiful woman. He has a 10 year old stepdaughter and so he's great but there was a lot of pain there and a lot of fear uh in the early days so that um I, I mean I'm not one of these people who say oh you need to suffer in order to have a decent life I don't believe that I mean I would wish nobody ever had to suffer but I do think that I learned a lot and became a different person because of that thank you thank you for elaborating a bit more on that um, to go back to some of the questions in the chat, how did you learn to write like a journalist? Was it just learn as you go? What was the biggest difference in writing for the style section versus the news? Well, I didn't learn. <clears throat> as I said in the beginning, I had no idea what I was doing. So I just wrote, I wrote, I, and I still do. I write like I'm talking to somebody. Oh. And this is what I'm doing with my novel. I have an editor I'm working with. <clears throat> and I, I send her pages. And it's very chatsy, you know? I mean, because I'm writing in the first person. I started it three years ago. I was writing in the third person. It didn't work for me. So about a few weeks ago, when I hired this new person who's fabulous, um, I started writing in the first person. And suddenly, it just all came out, you know, because I was I was very chatsy. And she'll say, but how did you know this was going to happen? I mean, I, I she said, I didn't know this was going to happen. I said, neither do I. I'm sitting here writing and I'm just channeling. And I'm thinking, oh, my God, what is she going to do? Oh, my God, don't tell me she's going to. You know. So, I mean, that's fiction writing. But journalism, I because I never was trained as a journalist. So I didn't know that. I mean, I never was trained to start with a, a lead that gave you the facts and all of that. It was always feature writing. It was always and very personal. My writing was always personal. And um, I don't think that in the 50 years that I've been at the Post, more well, 52, I don't think that I've had more than one story in the news section, in the, in the, on the front page, like a news story. Whereas I don't write that way. Um, now, more and more these days, they're putting feature stories on the front page of the, like the Post and the Times. But in those days, they didn't. And I would much prefer to be on the front page, own the whole front page of the style section, because that's what everybody reads. You know, so you you neither have a little byline on the front page with a little tiny, you know, over here, or you get the whole spread on the front page of style. So, and, and I think that people read style stories with more interest uh, because they're more intimate, they're more personal, they're more interesting. Somebody once said to me, what's the... How do you know what's a style story? And I said, it's anything that's interesting. I will write about anything that's interesting. I never had a beat. Thank you. So another question that we have 
is you once found a note in which Richard Nixon instructed his chief of staff not to invite you to things. Can you tell us about that? And do you still have the note? <laughs> the note is beautifully framed <clears throat> in my powder room downstairs with a gorgeous silk border background and then a gold filigree frame. Um, and Richard Nixon is one of my friends, Walter Pincus was doing some research in the National Archives and found this and Xeroxed it for me and sent it to me. And I was just ecstatic. He's taking notes, Haldeman, and Richard Nixon says, never invite Sally Quinn. She disobeyed the rules and attacked a guest at church. Well, of course I had to frame it and put it on the wall because what had happened was he started having these services in the East Room on Sunday, these worship services, and he would invite guests to come. And so, but the, we, the reporters were all sort of roped off. We weren't allowed to interview the guests. And so after one of the services, one of the guests was going out and I asked the guest a question. That was it. <laughs> Disobeyed the rules and attacked the guest at church. So I, I, you know, it was the most thrilling thing and I have it in my powder room and everybody who goes in there comes out just screaming with laughter. That is quite the funny little story. Um, our next question in the chat is, you restored the famous Grey Gardens estate. What was it like to work on and live in such a fascinating home? Well, I had read about Grey Gardens in, there was a cover story in New York Magazine. The place was falling down and Jackie Kennedy's aunt and her cousin were living there in squalor and had been condemned by the department of something rather sanitation and uh, <clears throat> it was a fascinating story and meanwhile my husband and I had bought a small house in Amagansett because we were just thinking about a pl summer place and we've got this tiny little house and but we had, were having family and we just didn't have enough room for everybody and so we decided to look for something larger and um, so I had a real estate agent took me everywhere from Montauk to Southampton. And I looked at all these houses and I just, and there was just nothing that sort of reached out to me. And so finally she said, well, there is Grey Gardens. And I said, oh my God, Grey Gardens, is that for sale? And she said, yes, but um, but it's it's a ruin. I mean, it needs to be torn down. And I said, no, 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 I wanna see it. I wanted to see it as a sightseer, you know, I was just so curious. So she took me over there, but she said, um, I'm not going into the house because there are like 36 cats in there and dead possums and fleas. And when the Maisel brothers had done their documentary there, they had to wear flea collars because it was so disgusting. And so I said, okay, okay, fine. So we go, she sits out in the car. I go to the front door, little Edie opens the door for me and she's dressed. She has a sort of turban around her head and she has a sweater wrapped around her waist for a skirt. And, and she, you know, lots of wild red lipstick. And I go into the hall and I say, oh God, this is the most beautiful house I've ever seen because it has, it just, it, it's just such a gracious house. And it's not a mansion by any means, despite what has been reported. It's a summer cottage. And I, I just fell in love with it. And she said, yes. And she did this little pirouette in the hall. And she said, all it needs is a coat of paint. <laughs> Well, <laughs> hundreds of thousands of dollars later, but anyway. So I said, um, well, I want to buy it. And I had just sold a book and she was asking $220,000 for it, which is nothing in the Hamptons, nothing. I mean, today, anyway, I said, I'm going to buy this house. And she said, you're the only person I'm going to sell it to. And she said, we have had so many offers. They've had offers, all kinds of offers. Everybody even wanting to pay more, but they would walk in and they'd say, boy, this is a perfect teardown, you know, but the property itself was on the Gold Coast. And so they didn't tear the house down. And she said, because you will restore it to its original beauty. So she sold it to me and she agreed on the spot. 
So I went home to my husband and I said, I've just bought this house with my own money. And so I took him over to see it and we got in the house. Ben is wildly allergic to cats. And um, so he gets, walks in the house, he looks at the house, immediately tears start rolling down his face. He's, he can't breathe, he, you know, and the back of the house was flapping in the wind. And I walked over to the piano and went plink, 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 and the whole piano collapsed and there were holes in the floor. And Edie lived in one little tiny room upstairs with on a mattress on the floor with one light bulb hanging over. It was disgusting, the smell cat feces everywhere smeared on the walls i mean it was beyond grotesque and ben looked at me and if you'll pardon the expression he said you are out of your fucking mind and i said well i'm gonna buy it so then all my friends had an intervention with me because the contractor came over and said there's no way you know it can't be restored and we could tear it down and we could rebuild it exactly the way it is for less money than what it would take to restore it. And I said, yeah, but then it wouldn't be Grey Gardens. And then so Ben started getting excited about it. And so we we bought it and um, uh, we were closing in November. My mother and I came up to, went up to East Hampton to close on the house. And it was one of those really eerie November days and the wind was howling and the clouds were, you know, and the, the ivy was creeping all over the house and sort of leaves falling off. And we walked in the door and locked the door. It was really scary. I mean, it would look like a haunted house. And we walked out to the porch sunroom, which all the glass was broken and the weeds were growing up. And, and all of a sudden we felt a presence and I looked up and there was this woman, gray haired woman standing in the living room door. And I was, I was with her. Ah! And I said, who are you? And she said, my name is Lois. And she said, I'm a friend of Big Edie. Big Edie had died, which is why Little Edie was selling the house. And she said, I just came to bring you a message from Big Edie. And she wants you to know that she chose you to buy this house. She is looking over her shoulder at you. She's looking down. She wants to you to know that everything is going to go perfect with this house. And she's going to make sure that it does. And so I had bet Carl Bernstein $100 that we would be in the house the following summer. He said, there's no, no, everybody said, there's no way. Um, and then this woman disappeared and the house was locked. I don't know where she even went. And so my, my mother and I started, I was so excited. I started smoking. <laughs> I just smoked that day for the first time. Um, anyway, that summer we were in the house in August. I mean, that, I mean, we were in the upstairs bedroom and the bedroom and the kitchen were finished and the workmen came every day, but we were in the house. So Carl had to pay, owed me, pay me $100. But the thing that came was funny is that the contractors did it faster than they said they would and charged less than they said they would. It was cheaper and faster than we ever thought it would be. So it was definitely a haunted house. And we I had it for 40, 45 years and loved it. But after Ben died, it wasn't the same. And so I just sold it. and. Um, and I'm not looked back once. Wow. Um, another question we have is, how do you think Ben would feel about the news business today? Not only the decline in the amount of newspapers, but also uh, all the news channels. Well, I think that Ben would be discouraged by the, you know, the diminishing number of newspapers because he really loved you know and I do too you know I don't have to subscribe to the actual paper but I get three papers and I just like to hold on to them but a lot of my friends I mean and much younger people don't ever even look at the paper and then and the numbers are dwindling um but Ben was very much he liked to look forward he you know he loved change he was very innovative so I think he would have understood this he didn't have a he didn't have an easy time with computers, that's for sure. But then neither did I, neither did a lot of us when they first started the post. I mean, I was just insulted that I had to work on this machine when my trusty typewriter was in front of me and I could pull tear sheets out and hand it to the copy, aid, you know. Um so, but I I think that um 
I think the worst part about it was uh, of what's happening in the world of news today for him uh, would be the lack of uh, the disinformation, the lack of truth. I think that would have driven him crazy. Um, I think when, I mean, people often ask me what Ben would think during the Donald Trump years. And I said, Ben would have been just, you know, totally laser focused on getting the story. Uh, and it wouldn't have been about Trump. It would have been about the story, you know, because uh, he was, Ben was not ideological. I mean, he believed in good and evil and all of that. So, I mean, I, he was a Democrat and a, and a liberal Democrat, but but he did not approach things with an ideological bent. It was like, gets the truth. Um, and, and he couldn't stand the lying. And I think that that would have, that would have been, that would have, he would have been undone by Donald Trump, just the lying. But, but he would have wanted to chronicle every single word of it. On the Washington Post wall, there's a huge three-story wall in the Washington Post. There's a, the conference room is called the Ben Bradley conference room. It's all glass. And then where they have the story conference and then the wall above it. And it has these huge quotes from Ben. And it says, the truth, no matter how painful, is always better than a lie. And um, and that was his his whole thing was about lying and, and about getting the truth. So I think that in terms of what's happening with journalism, I think there's always going to be a way for people to get to the truth. So I think he would have found a way to get to the truth and whatever form it took. Wonderful. I'm seeing no more questions in the chat, so I'm going to ask you a final one today. In 2019, the Washington Post celebrated Styles' 50th birthday. Today, every major newspaper in the country has a Styles section. In the world. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Despite the enormous success and influence Style has had on journalism, last year you wrote a piece for the Post that declared the end of DC's elite social scene. What's changed? Well, I think probably the 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 thing that's the saddest thing that's changed is that there is a lack of uh, communication and a lack of dialogue um, between people of different persuasions. and and um, and i I'm sorry about that because I think that, you know, I hate to say in the old days, but there was a time when Republicans and Democrats could actually be friends and get together after work and their families were friends and you know they would all live in it they'd live in the same neighborhoods their kids would go to the same schools uh, and they would see each other socially and i think that um their division now is so intense that um it it just that just doesn't exist anymore and um and you know even people who try to reach out it's really hard to reach out with people because it's not, I think that the, the people who are Trump supporters are not necessarily, it's not about politics. It's not even about ideology. I, I think it's about morals and ethics and values. And so if you wanna be friendly with somebody, if you wanna socialize with somebody, you really want those people to share your morals and your ethics and your values. And I think a lot of the Trump supporters don't share those values with moderate Republicans and Democrats. And um, I mean, I know a lot of moderate Republicans who I'm sorry to say will still support Trump even though they find him loathsome and evil, but somehow they've lost their moral compasses. But that makes it really hard to be around people you don't admire if they've lost their moral compasses. And uh, so that makes socializing different. So now it's a lot of it is journalists um, and most journalists are a liberal persuasion. And so, you know, if they're Democrat in the White House and Democrats on Congress, they'll see each other, but you, there's really almost no mixing at all. Perfect. Well, I just want to say thank you so much, Sally, for your time today. It has been a great honor to be able to interview you. Um, so thank you. Well, thank you for interviewing me. And I have to say, you've lived up your reputation. You are awesome. <laughs> you know, your questions were great. So thank you.